1 Kings chapter 18, verse 30, the Bible says, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. In 31, And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made the trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. Now notice in verse 33, And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Well, I suppose when you pour four barrels of water in the, in the stack of wood, it would be wet soak. But after that, in verse 34 down to verse 37, Elijah prayed and mentioned 63 words in his prayer. And notice what happened he pray, after he prayed. The Bible says in verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell. Amen. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. So you may be seated. Thank you very much. Well, if you would allow me tonight, I would like to deliver a message I entitled, How Did Elijah Get the Fire to Come Down? How did Elijah get the fire to come down? Well, in the Bible, the word fire is so important because it pictures about different nature and characteristics of God. In the New Testament, the word fire speaks about the Holy Spirit. But in the Old Testament, the word fire was used in many different ways, and it pictures different nature of God. I'll give you an example. Remember Moses when he was in the, in the wilderness, and all of a sudden, his attention was caught by a burning bush. And when he about to approach that burning bush, all of a sudden, he heard a voice, and it says, Moses... Take off thy shoes because you're standing on a holy ground. Because I believe that fire in that burning bush, it speaks about God's presence. The presence of God was on that fire. We all know the story about the Israelites when they were traveling in the wilderness. The Bible says when they were in the wilderness, God gave them a pillar of clouds to give them shades a day. And then this pillar of clouds will turn into a pillar of fire to give them lights at night. And I believe that fire that traveled with them in the wilderness, it speaks about God's provision. Because God provided them shades at day, and God provided them light at night. We all know the story about the three Hebrew men, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they stood for their conviction. When, when they live for their faith, as a result of that, they were cast down to the fire. But the Bible says when they were in the fire, they never burned, they never bend, they never bound. Because I believe that fire in that fire furnace it speaks about God's protection. God protected them in the fire. We saw that Elijah, when he prayed, when, when, when they pour four barrels of water in that altar and prayed 63 words in his prayer. And right after he prayed, the fire came down and consumes Elijah's offering. And I believe the fire that consumes Elijah's offering it speaks about God's power. We all need the power of God. We all need the power of God. But I know, I don't know if you agree with me, but we cannot deny the facts that we are living in a fast-moving, computerized world. Right. It seems everything are made per push button. Right. You push that button and you can get an instant cash. Yeah. You push that button and you can even talk to your kids, even though they were in, in the other side of the world. Yeah. Just like what we're doing. In fact, whenever we travel, we always take our kids on our phone. While I was driving, we were showing them the, the, the sights of America. 
They only say one thing. Is that America? It's all field. It's all farm. It's all, you know, cornfield. Because they were expecting when America, when you say America, there would be big buildings, you know. But anyway, even when, in fact, whenever we are, we are going to Walmart, our children always say, Daddy, when you go to Walmart, just call us up. We want to see Walmart. <laughs> you know, sure enough, when we were at Walmart, we called them up and I say, we are now in Walmart. What do you want to see? They only have one request. Daddy, take us to toy section, please. <laughs> toy section. So we brought them in toy section and we're showing them, here's the toys, because they never seen that much toy before. And they were so fascinated and amazed with so many toys. And, and then my youngest son, who is nine, he started saying, Daddy, I want that, I want that, I want that. And he was pointing to those Nerf guns. You know, he was pointing to those Nerf guns. And, 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 and he likes the snipers, you know. I don't know why, but so I took that snipers and I really want to buy it. But when I look at the price, it's too much. And I cannot say no to my son because they were sacrificing too while we are here. So I told him, well, I, how will I say this? I don't know how to play excuses to my kids. So I took that sniper gun, uh, that Nerf sniper gun, and I said, do you want this? Yes, Daddy. Okay, I'll send it to you. Wait on it. I'll send it through the, to this phone. You know? But I said, my son, it won't fit on my phone. I'm so sorry. I cannot send it to you. It's my way of excuse. I cannot buy it. Technology. I remember the time. There's a good story here. When we first came to, to Stewart, uh, down in Stewart, Patrick Spring, uh, Virginia. We arrived like in June and it was so hot. Uh, it, it was summertime, not this time, but the other time we were here. Uh, it was summertime and I was so thirsty. So we came, up, we came from, from Virginia, uh, from, from an airport and drove about four hours and we get to the parsonage and I said, I'm so thirsty, we need to, we, uh, we need to drink something. So I asked my wife, you dress up and I'll buy you a drink. Well, not, not the kind of drink you're thinking, but it's, it's a, a, a soda, okay? So um, we drove around and we saw this beautiful, fancy, fast food Wendy's, you know? So we, we get in and I told my wife, you order me a drink and I'll find a seat. So while I was looking for a seat, my wife made an order and, and after she got the order, she was looking at me, and I was sitting on, you know, on the table, and she, look, she was looking at me, and she was showing me the empty cup. You know, and, and my wife says, they give me empty cup. And I said, ask them, I need a drink, not an empty cup. <laughs> I think the cashier understood our gesture, and the cashier was pointing to that silver box. So we went there, and I was standing in front of that silver box, and I was looking for my drink. And I even knocked on that silver box. Hello, is there anyone there? I need my drink. Thank God someone noticed us. It was an old man. And you will re re recognize the name, J.D. Walker. He saw us in Wendy's talking to that machine, and he tapped me and he said, I think you you're, you're need some help. And I said, I do. Can you help me? And he said, well, here's the thing. Do you see that screen? You touch that, and you choose from there, and you can have your drink. And I said, oh, that's easy. You know what? Technologies are good, but sometimes they were so complicating. But you know what? Everything are made for push button. And we wanted the high-end technology most of the time. And by wanting the high-end, we are coping up. We, put more, we, we, we are working harder. We put more time so that we could have the high-end technology. And by putting extra time, we didn't realize that our fire, 
are being stolen by our desire. We didn't realize that our fire are being stolen by our ambition. That our fire are being taken away for being busy or even with our business. In the passage that we just read, Elijah was in a great battle. It is a battle between, a battle that never happened before. Because it was a battle between two opinions. Whether the Israelites will choose to serve God or whether they will choose to serve Baal. It is a battle between two gods. One God, one living God against the combining gods of Baal and Asherah. It is a battle between two prophets. 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah against one prophet of a living God. And the basis of being a winner is by means of a fire. Elijah got up in verse 23 and 24. He gave the instruction to those prophets and he said, Okay guys, since you are so many, I want you to choose one bullock. You dress it, put it in your altar, but don't put fire on it. But instead, I want you to pray to Baal and ask him to send you a fire. And if Baal will send you a fire, then these people of Israel will choose to serve your God. With confidence, those 850 prophets of Baal, they choose one bullock, they dress it, and they began to pray. They started dancing around, limping, limping around, and yet there was no fire. Until mid-noon came and, start, and Elijah got up again in verse 27, and he tried to mark those prophets, and he said, guys, what's going on? You've been praying for almost half a day, and yet you don't have the fire. Elijah said, probably you're not doing so well. Yeah. Or probably your God is asleep. Yeah. You need to wake him up. Sure. You need to cry louder. Yeah. You need to dance more. I, 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 you, know, I, you need to dance more to get the attention of your God. I'll tell you this. The reason why Baal cannot send a fire because Baal is not a real God. Because Baal is not a real God. After that, Elijah got up again and mocked the people and said, Guys, it's been almost the whole day and yet you don't have the fire. You know what they did? They started to cut themselves with knives and lashes and still there was no fire. I'll tell you this. Aren't you glad tonight that we serve the same God who created the heavens and the earth? He is the same God who divided the Red Sea. Give sight to the blind and let the lame to walk. He is also the same God who answered the prayer of the prophet and answered the prayer of the disciples. And he will be the same God that will answer our prayer tonight. We don't have to climb on the highest mountain just to get the attention of our God. We don't have to cut ourselves, even our backs, just to get the attention of our God. Because I believe our God is only a whisper away from us. He's only a whisper away from us. And He never gets tired in listening to our prayers. There are three things that Elijah did while he got the fire. He said in verse 30, look at in verse 30, And Elijah said unto all the people, It seemed Elijah was saying, Okay guys, you prophets of Baal and Asherah, you're done. You don't have the fire. You lose. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. If you are here tonight, and your fire is about to worn out, you are entering into the losing side. If you want to be in a victorious side, Keep the fire burning. You know what Elijah said? Okay, guys, come near unto me. It seemed Elijah was saying, Come near unto these ordinary men. Because through these ordinary men, God can perform His extraordinary power. Aren't you glad tonight that God uses ordinary men and women like you and me so that he can perform his extraordinary power. Think about this. What if God will set a standard before he can use anyone? Do you think anyone would pass that standard? 
What if God will say, I will only use those who are smart? What if God will say, I will only use those who are, those who are good looking? Do you think anyone would pass that standard? I think only one would pass that standard. And that would be me. <laughs> but thank God, he wasn't looking on her physical appearance. He wasn't looking on her educational attainment. Even with our age, even with our bank accounts, what God is looking is an ordinary man so that he can perform his extraordinary power. Look at what he did after he called up the people and showing them how mighty his God is. Look at in verse 30, the first thing he did, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. The first thing he did, he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Right. There was the restoration of relationship. Yeah. Remember when those prophets of Baal began to dance around? The altar were loose. It was broken. Right. Remember Adam and Eve when God created them with a perfect relationship with God? Because of their sin, of their disobedience, this perfect relationship was cut off. And even the Bible says, because of our sin, we come short of the glory of God. Right. Let us accept the facts. No matter how good you are, you're still a sinner. Yeah. If, you don't, if you don't accept, if you did not accept Christ, you are still bound to hell. No matter how good you are, no matter how rich you are. Because the only way to Jesus Christ, the only way to heaven is our Lord Jesus Christ. But how can we have the fire? We must restore that relationship first. I remember the time when I was a young boy. I grew up in a broken family. I was only five years old when my father left us because of another woman. And I have three more other siblings. After my father left us, my mother decided to split up the family for the second time around. She sent me and my brother to my grandma and my two sisters to my other grandma. And then my mother left the country to find her fortune in other country. So as brothers and sisters, we never experienced playing in one roof together. We never experienced growing up together. We never experienced calling our father, father, and calling our mother, mother, because we grew up in different homes. In fact, when I was a young boy, I even told my grandma, I said, Grandma, when I grow up, when I grew up, I'd like to become a policeman someday. And then my grandma said, why is that? So that when I have a gun, I'd like to find my father and kill him. That was my ultimate desire because my father abandoned us. And since my father abandoned us, we've experienced a lot of hardship in life. One day, I was playing in our backyard when someone invited me to attend in a Sunday school class. And it was my first time to hear the word Sunday school. And it sounded delicious. And I said, I'm curious. I want to come to that class. It sounded like after I attended the class, they might give me Sunday, you know, the ice cream. Yeah. I came to that class expecting after the class that they would give me ice cream. I was sitting in the back pew when the preacher preached about the reality of hell. Yeah. And I just found myself kneeling in the altar, accepting Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. It was March 17, 1985, when I got saved. It was March 17, 1985, when I restored that relationship. Sure. It was March 17, 1985, when God changed my desire from killing my father into winning my own father. You know the rest of the story. You've seen it in the video. After I graduated from high school, I became a pastor at the age of 18. I was chosen to come in, in Marietta and came back in 96. During the time around 2003, I was preaching in, our, in, our, in, in, in one of our churches, and there was a big bus full over in front of our church, and there was a man get off 
and came and, and visited our place. And I still remember that day because I was preaching a message entitled, How Shall We Escape If We Neglect So Great Salvation? After that message, I held an invitation while the congregation were singing, Just As I Am. That old man left the, the pew and went to the altar because he wanted to get saved. While the congregation were singing, I bent down to that man and explained to him the simplest way of salvation. And I remember that he accepted Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. Amen. Sure enough, after the congregation, were, after they sang the invitational song, I held up the man because I'm about to introduce him to, co to the congregation. But I forgot to ask his name. So I turned my face to that man because he was, he was bowing down. He was stooping down. And I said, sir, sorry, but I never get your name. Can I have your name, please? And he whispered to me his name, and I was surprised, and I was shocked because we have the same last name. We have the same last name. And I look at, I look at that man, and I said, sir, this is weird, but who are you? How did you get here? I got so many questions to ask him. Because since the time my father left us, we don't have any image of him. We don't have any picture of him. I don't know how he looked like. But when I look at him and he look at me, it looked like I was looking on the mirror. I look at him and I said, who are you? And that man said, I am your long lost father that you've never seen for 25 years. He got saved. He got saved. Listen to me, my friend. If you are here tonight and you have a broken relationship with your loved ones, if you want the fire, restore that relationship back. If you have a, if you have a broken relationship with your pastor, restore that relationship with the Lord. If you have a broken relationship with anyone around you, restore the relationship we have with the Lord. The same day, I called my brother because he's also a preacher. And I said, brother, I have a very special guest. And my brother said, you sounded, you're so excited. So he must be the mayor of the town. And I said, he's much better than the mayor of the town because he is our long lost father. And my brother said, how did he get there? I told him on the phone, well, if God used the big fish for Jonah, to take him in his will. I think God used the big boss yeah. to take our father into his will. Yeah. The same day I called my two sisters because they were also married to preachers now. Out of a broken family, we got saved because of a simple action. Restore the relationship. Amen. Restore yeah. the altar. I know for sure that our family will, have, will never be reunited again because my father just died last December. But one thing is sure, up in heaven, sure. he's waiting. When the trumpet of the Lord will sound, there will be great reunion for all of us. But it would be more special because we will be reunited again with our earthly father. If you are praying for someone, hang in there. Because the Lord has his own time to answer our prayer. It took me 17 years to pray for the salvation of my father. But the first thing you need to do, restore the relationship. Amen. Secondly, look at in verse 32. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of of the Lord. Remember the altar? When, when 850 prophets dance around the altar, they leap around the altar, that's why some of the stones were loose. Some of the stones were even kicked out of the place. You know what Elijah did when he wants the fire? He took those stones one by one. 
He carried them back in their original position. He took another stones and put it back in their original position. You know what are the pictures of those stones are? Those stones are picture of our family. Did you know that our family were founded and instituted by God? Our God started the family. But because of materialism and self-gratification, most families are running away from God. I remember the time when I was a young boy, every 6 o'clock in the evening, my grandmother will used to call, call us. And she will say, Jason, come home. It's 6 o'clock. It's time for us to pray. When I was a young boy, we used to pray at 6 o'clock in the evening. But it's sad to say, nowadays, not too many families are praying together. Sure. Not too many families are meeting together in the altar. Why? Because there's, there's, there, because there's a lot of family that are still loose. That, that are still away from their original position. Those stones speaks about our ambition. Those stones speaks about our desire. Those stones speaks about our priorities, our families, our everything. We need to put them back in their original position right there in the altar. Amen. You know what the Bible says in Matthew 6, 33? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The key to repair our altar is to seek the kingdom of God. But the big question is, what is seeking the kingdom of God means? In my own point of view, seeking God's kingdom is this. If we let Jesus to be in charge or in control of our lives, if we let Jesus to be in control of our everything, our all in all, when you are under his lordship, and when he is in control of your life, that is the kingdom of God. It is, not, uh, it is not the rules and the regulation, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Romans 14, 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Even in Colossians 3.17, the Bible says, Whatsoever you do in words or deeds, do all in the name of the Lord. Listen to this. Our main responsibility as Christians is all about the glory of God. Amen. It's all about the glory of God. The main reason of our existence is this. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear the whole conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of men. We exist to exalt God, to evangelize the sinner, equipping the saints, and to edify the believers. We need to set our priorities right with God, and we need to lay our future at God's hand. We need to prioritize. Listen to this. We need to let go of the mundane things of life and choose the better things, which is life and peace and joy and heaven. There was an old saying that says, all truly successful people in life have been those who prioritize. They have their priorities in order. Think about this. Having wrong priorities in our lives is like buttoning our coat incorrectly. God expects us to fulfill all of his priorities. I read this article one time. It says, we often say life is short. Better enjoy it. How about eternity is long? Better prepare for it. Lastly, look at in verse 33. Give me two more minutes and I'll shut up. In verse 33 it says, And he put the wood in order 
and cut the bullock in pieces. Let us compare Elijah's offering and the prophets of Baal's offering. Do you know what the main difference of their offering is? At, at, the, at Baal's offering, the prophets cut themselves. But with Elijah's offering, he cut the sacrifice. And what would possibly happen if you cut an animal? It will bleed. Because the third thing that Elijah did, there is repentance through the blood. I heard that many churches nowadays in America that don't believe in the power of the blood anymore. But you know what, my friend? As long as I can shout, as long as my God answers my prayer, I still believe in the power of the blood. The same yesterday, today, and forever. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Because I believe His blood is perfect. His blood is pure. His blood is perpetual. His blood is precious. His blood is powerful. It can protect us. It can purify us. And it can preserve life. It was the blood why Abel's offering was accepted. It was the blood of the animal that covered the sin of the Israelites. It was the blood that tore the veils, the veil in the temple. It was the blood that saved the lives of the firstborn in Egypt. It was the blood that opens the windows of heaven and gave us access in the throne of God. It was His blood that cleanses us and gave us power to become the sons of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join ears with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. It was the blood. You know what, my friend? In the altar where we can find His peace. Right in this altar where we can feel his presence. Right in this very altar where we can follow his power. But the big question is, when was the last time you were in the altar of the Lord? Do we still have the, fo used, we, do we still have the fire that we used to have in reading our Bible? Do we still have the fire of coming to church, winning soul? praying for the ministry, praying for the pastor. Do we still have the fire of loving the missionary? If not, you need the fire. You need to restore that fire. You need the repentance. You need to repair the, 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 the broken altar. After Elijah did these three things, the Bible says in verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell. Do you want the fire? Sure. Amen. Come to the altar of the Lord. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.